savvy guy. He's listening. Uh, Putin's a pretty savvy guy, and he knows what those counterforce scenarios look like, and he knows that nobody will win. More to the point, Soviet military doctrine says that there is no need for the first use of nuclear weapons absent a direct threat to legitimacy and continuation of the regime, right? So if the government in Moscow is not going to fall, there's no case for Soviet or Russian first use of nuclear weapons in the current context. But what other lovers does Vladimir Putin have to pull? And that's what tonight's conversation is going to be about. So uh, my name is Jim Lutis. I am with the Pell Center at Salve Virginia University. Uh, I've been thinking about this stuff for a really long time. And for most of that time, nobody cared. I mean, not even a little bit, right? Um, but something funny happened in the last several years, and that's going to be sort of where we start tonight. So I need to preface all of this by telling you, I am a Cold War kid. Born in 1971, came of political consciousness in the 1980s. And so my look at the Soviet era in particular is categorized by the three Bs. And you're going to know what these three Bs are too. The first, of course, is James Bond. The second is Boris and Natasha. And the third, of course, is Rocky Balboa. I tell you this because I have biases. I have biases. I grew up in an age where the Soviets were the bad guys, right? I watched Red Dawn and thought, yeah, yeah, Wolverines, right? This is something that is important as you listen to the presentation that I'm about to make. You might disagree with me, and I hope that you will call me out on the stuff that you think I'm going too far. But I wanted you to know where I'm coming from. So I thought growing up that I would spend my days uh, as a Sovietologist working for the CIA that I would look at pictures like this, try to picture who was standing, try to understand who was standing next to whom on top of Lenin's tomb in Red Square. And because of that, I would have keen insight into who was rising and who was descending into power structures of the old Soviet system. So I went to school, I studied hard, I studied history, I studied foreign languages, including Russian. And then in the middle of my sophomore year, after my first semester of Russian, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. And all of those career plans went. So uh, I, I, dust, I dusted myself off, but I went to Georgetown University where I studied Cold War history. And I studied America's use of information as a weapon in the Eisenhower administration. And I got exposed to this whole world of, of processes and techniques and tactics, often called political warfare in that era, more recently information warfare. The Russians preferred to call it something like active measures. But it's all the same set of tools, the same set of ideas that we can use information as a weapon and we can achieve strategic results through the direct application of information in particular contexts. So I finished up at Georgetown in 2003 and I spent the next, I can't remember how many years, almost a decade, uh, bouncing back and forth between government jobs on, on Capitol Hill. I spent some time uh, working uh, uh, in the Pentagon for the Obama-Biden transition team. Full disclosure, I'm a Democrat. You check my bio, it's not going to shock anybody, but it may cloud what you think I'm saying, so I get that bias out of the way as well. Um, but I worked for John Kerry in the Senate. I worked on the Obama-Biden transition team. And then I launched a think tank called the American Security Project, which was a bipartisan effort uh, to try to think about what are the challenges facing the United States. And all the while that I was working on this stuff, Nobody cared about disinformation. Nobody really cared about information even as a weapon. There were some people talking about cybersecurity and cyber warfare and digital Pearl Harbors, but nobody was talking about information the way that I had studied it and the way we would see it come to be employed in the last several years. Instead, I spent that time working on counterterrorism, on uh, nuclear security, on uh, force structure for the U.S. military, hard national security issues. And Nobody, I mean, nobody cared about the stuff that I had really been passionate about in grad school until 2016, when as the summer progressed and I was watching the news, I realized that there were a number of things playing out, uh, particularly around the release of information by WikiLeaks, which was unmistakably pulled from some of the Cold War tactics that both the United States and the Soviets had used 50 years previously. 
And I watched it for a little while and I scratched my head about it. And I finally, I wrote a column for this policy journal called War on the Rocks. The Russians read our Cold War playbook. And I described, published before Election Day 2016, uh, basically the phenomenon that we were seeing, the tactics, the strategy that I think bore out. You can find this, it's free online. Uh, but basically, I nailed it. Right? The, the, the tactics that the Russians were using are as old as information itself. Uh, and they were, they were uh, refined and crystallized uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. The United States borrowed it, they borrowed it back. It goes back and forth in a cycle like that. But the point is, the tactics that we're seeing used against the United States now, in our recent past, in our distant past, and in our future, are tried and true because they work. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, too. So first question that I, that I ask when I talk about this issue is, what is war? All right? And so when I've got a group of students, we sit around and we talk about this, and you get some philosophical discussion. I'm just going to jump right to the chase. A really classic definition of war is political violence between two or more states. Political violence, so violence where you're trying to achieve something. So that's the politics part of it, right? Political violence between two or more states. It's a classic definition of war. But there's a problem with that. In my lifetime, I can cite two specific examples of conflicts that, well, in the case of the Cold War, had a uh, less of a direct military confrontation element to it. And it was, certainly was uh, between states, so you got half of the definition. And in the war on terror, there was certainly political violence, but there weren't, it wasn't between two or more states. So that classic definition of war doesn't really work. The United States is really, really good at breaking foreign adversaries' uh, uh, military infrastructure. So this is a picture of the so-called highway of death. It was the main road uh, out of Kuwait City, north to Iraq, after the 1991 uh, Gulf War, after 100 days of aerial campaign and American forces operating on the ground. This was the fleeing Iraqi force, what was left of it. We are really, really good at breaking enemies' hardware and their organization to, to wage war at the military level. But less than 10 years later, in a new war in Iraq, American Marines had to go back into Fallujah, not once, not twice, not three times, at least four times, to try to put down an insurgency. So how can we be so good at this and have a really hard time at that? And this takes us back to a classic definition of what constitutes warfare. Well, Karl von Clausewitz, the classic Prussian strategist, said, war is not about the breaking of organizations or equipment or military or even killing a bunch of people. War is about the breaking of will. The breaking of will. So through most of human history, that was, well, you kill the other enemy, the other, uh, your adversary's military, you kill more of them than they kill of you, and you've broken their will. They can't resist you anymore. You impose your will by literally flattening all of industrial Europe and Asia, right? That was the approach in World War II, and it worked, but a huge cost, right? And then at the end of World War II comes the atomic age, where one bomb could destroy an entire city. And the challenge that rose from this is that how do you then confront an adversary who maybe it doesn't have the same appreciation of the value of life that you have? So you've got to do something to try to deter them or change their behavior, or as Clausewitz would put it, bend their will without actually firing a shot. Because the cost of a future war would be so great that, as Eisenhower used to say, you would destroy the very thing you were, very thing you were trying to preserve. So strategists in this era came up with something that they called Cold War. Now, notice what I said here. It's lowercase c, lowercase w. Not capital C, capital W. The era between 1947 and 1991, characterized by two bipolar competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. Cold War. Little c, little w, a set of tactics. You try to impose your will on your adversary without firing a shot. Now, this was not just an American approach. This was also the approach of the Soviet Union. Oleg Kalugin is one of the most senior KGB defectors to the West. He spoke uh, after he defected about the Soviet approach, which they called, again, active measures. Active measures to weaken the West, to drive wedges in the Western community alliances of all sorts, particularly NATO. 
So discord among allies to weaken the United States in the eyes of the people of Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America. Active measures to try to sow discord, undermine alliances, undermine the political cohesion of your adversaries. If your adversaries are not politically cohesive, they have a hard time offering resistance. Keep that thought in mind. All right, so past this prologue. I've got literally about three weeks worth of slides that I could go through tonight. I'm going to sl slide through some of these at world record pace. If we want to come back to them or you want me to stop and say, no, explain that, Jim, I'm happy to do that. Okay. But Vladimir Putin is, uh, I think, important to know that he grew up watching the, the, the Soviet version of the same movies I was watching. Right. So I was watching James Bond. He was watching movies about KGB men who were changing the world, changing the world, saving the Soviet Union, saving communism through their heroism. And that resonated with him. So as a young man, he joined the KGB. In 1980, through, throughout the 1980s, he was working as, at the KGB. It was an incredible story about him in the Dresden field office in 1989 as East Germany collapsed. We can get to that in detail later if you like. But by 1998, he's the head of the FSB. The, the, the Then Soviet Union's gone. This is now the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service. And then from 2000 to 2008, and again, 2012 until the present, he's been the president of Russia. And he's been motivated by a lot of things. Principally, he's been motivated by a desire to see Russia uh, reemerge as, as an important player on the international scene. And to do that, he has felt, and he's taken actions to try to achieve, the reduction of organizations, entities that either counter Russia or exclude Russia, principally NATO and the European Union. So Poland's objectives, very, very briefly, we could spend an entire night talking about this, but his objectives are he wants a free hand for Russia and his government, both domestically and internationally. And so that means eliminate those institutions or so weaken those institutions that they're no longer relevant that exclude Russia. So that's the, Uni the European Union, that's uh, NATO, and you want to weaken America's position in Europe because that's the great equalizer, right? He wants to eliminate sanctions against his government. Now, we've had a lot of sanctions put on Russia since February 24th of this year. But there, were, there have been sanctions upon sanctions upon sanctions going back to 2014 and even earlier for the first invasion of Ukraine and a whole host of other uh, offenses. Uh, he wants to weaken the political cohesion of Russia's primary rivals. That's where we're going to spend a lot of time talking tonight. And ideologically, he favors personal relationships rather than institutional relationships. That's a long, complicated story about international relations theories and how autocrats and, and democracies interact with one another. But we'll put that point there. And to this guy, this is General Valery Gerasimov, the chief of the Russian general staff. Uh, he is uh, credited in 2013 with publishing an article in a pretty obscure Russian technical journal that described a new approach to international statecraft. And there's a quote that I want to get right. He talked about the use of technologies for influencing state structures and the population with the help of information networks. Say that one more time. The use of technologies for influencing state structures and the population with help with the help of information networks. In other words, he's talking about using social media and the modern internet era against the West. He concedes in that article, look, Russia is never gonna be able to compete with the United States in terms of military technology or the amount of money that they're willing and able to spend on their military technology. So let's use this other set of tools, these information tools, these internet era tools to achieve our ends, right? So this is called, there's a debate about whether or not this is actually a doctrine, but for shorthand, it's the Gerasimov doctrine. It's what guides Russian foreign policy for at least the next five years. All right, so we're talking about political warfare, we're talking about information warfare. If we were talking about nuclear war, we'd be way over on the right-hand side of this chart, right? Off the theater conventional uh, category, we'd be out there by that door, right? That's where nuclear war is. The stuff we're talking about, political warfare, way on this edge on the left-hand side of the screen, okay? It's as, it's as far to the left as you can possibly go. You don't, want, you don't want the use of force. You're trying to avoid the use of force, but you're trying to achieve the same objective. I'll give you an example of one from uh, some history in 1959. 
So 1959, uh, Germany, West Germany, uh, so remember after the war, the uh, Germany is split into an East and a West. The Soviets dominate the East, the Allies are in the West. And by 1959, West Germany is ready to join the unified NATO military command, putting all of Germany's manpower and material into the Western alliance. The Soviets didn't like this, and they wanted to undermine the cohesion of the alliance. So what did they do? They slipped three intelligence officers across the old inner German border, and they went to a former Jewish synagogue in one particular city near the old intra-German border uh, between East and West Germany. And they had their agents paint a couple of swastikas on the outside of the walls. Now, this was a taboo in the immediate aftermath of the war. The swastika was a forbidden symbol. This is the start of one of the uh, swastika waves that periodically swept across West Germany and Western Europe in the aftermath of the Second World War. But the Soviets understood, because they had actually experimented with this in Ukraine, different story, was that once a taboo was broken, it would go, to borrow a contemporary term, viral. And so in this particular case, those swastikas swept across West Germany, France, England, and one even wound up in the port of New York because the taboo had been broken. What the Soviets were trying to do was undermine the West's confidence in the guilty trustworthiness, denazification of the West Germans. And they did it by attacking something that they knew was a lingering question and suspicion and allied mind. Could you really trust, trust the Germans? So 1949, for a few years earlier, the CIA puts out its first field manual. And in its advice to people who are going to be engaged in psychological warfare is this little note, exploit existing issues. And you can read this for yourself. The stuff that I want to draw your attention to is that the skilled operator very rarely attempts to make a new fissure in the armor of the enemy's morale. Doesn't try to create a new issue, right? He selects with care weaknesses which already exist and insists upon them with artful suggestion and reminder. So don't try to create an issue. Don't say, hey, you know what? I think Americans should be mean to blonde haired people because that's not going to work. Figure out what Americans already divide and attack themselves over. And that's the issue that we play. And that's what. Any good information warrior, whether you're an American or Russian or Frenchman, whatever, that's what you do. You exploit existing issues. So I'm going to ask you this question, audience participation time here, right? If you were going to target the United States, what is the existing scab in American life that you would pick at to try to get a response? You guys get an A plus, right? Racism. Racism. And guess what? There is a long history of this predating the Second World War. These gentlemen are known as the Scottsboro Boys, 1931. They were accused of raping two women, two white women, on a train in Alabama. Uh, there, were, there was a lynch mob. They were saved from the lynch mob. They were put on trial. Uh, the first trial ended in a hung jury. The second trial, uh, after the end of the, there was a mistrial because one of the, uh, of the women who was uh, the victims claimed that she and her friend had made it all up. And in the third, third one, they were all convicted and put, to, put into prison. The Soviets loved this story. The Soviets loved the story because it seemed to expose a cancer in American society, undermine all of our, our, our rhetoric about freedom and equality. And so for 30 years in Soviet-sponsored newspapers around the world, including in some communist papers in the United States, this was a constant refrain. Remember the Scottsboro Boys, right? So that's 1931. This is a little Cold War propaganda. Up here, it's the top of the skyscraper. You see Wall Street. And then you see, uh, this is uh, Svoboda pa, America, no, Svoboda pa Amerikansky, which is uh, freedom American style. And so you got freedom of speech. And this is the, 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 uh, the uh, 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 antecedent to fake news because it says lies and, and slander coming out on those ducks. Um, uh, freedom of opinion, but corporate America is telling you what to think. Uh, lower right-hand corner is freedom of assembly, but the police are coming to, to, to break it up. Of 
course, because they're guided by the almighty dollar. In that top right-hand corner, freedom of identity. And it is the Klan lynching a black man. They've exploited this again and again and again, and not just at American audiences. In the New York Times in uh, 1960, there was a story about a racist letter sent to all of the Asian and African members of the United Nations, uh, basically uh, stringing together a litany of racist insults that would uh, make you pass out. So we're not going to repeat them. Um, tar but, but, but signed, uh, you know, courtesy of the American Ku Klux Klan. Except the letter was not sent by the American KKK. It was sent by the Soviet KGB. And they were simply trying to exploit the understanding to the rest of the world that America was a flawed society and you couldn't really trust it. That's 1960. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the favorite targets of Soviet disinformation. They hated him. They hated him because he preached racial reconciliation. He preached the idea that, the, that America should find its, uh, its bearings in the founding ideals of the Declaration of Independence. He wasn't preaching race war, which is what the Soviets really wanted, because that would really uh, rip us apart. And so they hated him, and they helped spread information that was really slanderous and offensive about Martin Luther King, essentially calling him an Uncle Tom uh, because he didn't favor more um, aggressive uh, uh, actions by the, by the civil rights movement until he died. And then in all of the propaganda outlets the Soviets controlled, Martin Luther King Jr. became a great, great martyr whose death must be avenged, right? Because really all, they don't really care one way or the other. They just want to rip up, whip up some uh, violence in the United States. All right, so this brings us up to the, the current year. And in 2016, I know some of us feel like, oh, man, we got to hear this again. In 2016, the Russians went back to that playbook. They went back particularly to the issues of race and identity as a way of trying to drive a wedge into the American electorate. And they did a number of things uh, to, to, to really try to influence that, that outcome. We can discuss some of this in detail in the Q&A. If you don't agree with me, just go with it for a minute, and we'll come back to it. They used the military intelligence services to boost the candidacy of Donald Trump. This has been well documented in a bipartisan study by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. They also used their intelligence services to undermine the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. But the two areas that I really want to focus on are these. They used military intelligence services to probe election infrastructure. So the way we vote, it didn't change votes, but the mechanisms that we use to make sure that, hey, that person can vote and that person can't, they were messing around there. And the fourth thing that they did is that they used social media troll farms to, to micro-target Americans with divisive messages. So those are the two things that I really want to concentrate on tonight. This is the uh, Internet Research Agency. It's a pretty nondescript looking office building in St. Petersburg, Russia. But that is one of the one of the troll farms that the Russian government uses to try to influence American elections and American politics. Uh, so you've got a bunch of sort of 20-something uh, Russian uh, English speakers in there creating memes and uh, uh, tweets and social media posts, creating accounts and often fake personas that often take extreme positions on American elections. We know about this because this guy here, Adrian Chen, who is a, is a really a talented journalist, wrote a story about it in 2015 for the New York Times Magazine. And it was interesting, in the course of that reporting, he came up with a list of Russian Twitter accounts that he knew were controlled by the Internet Research Agency. And the weird thing was that in December of 2015 and January of 2016, they all stopped tweeting about climate issues and politics in France and whatever else they were tweeting about. And they all became Christian evangelical accounts supporting Donald Trump. He said, wait a minute, what? What just happened here? So he knew that there was something going on. And so some of these accounts are things like Blacktivist. Blacktivist was a uh, Black Lives Matter friendly account that actually had more Facebook followers than the, than the official Black Lives Matter account. And they got caught because one day they actually left their uh, geotagging on with one of their posts and it said St. Petersburg, Russia. 
Uh, whoops, right? But they uh, created, th th their claim to fame was they would post videos, images, news reports of police brutality against African American men, right? That's a real issue, right? The Russians didn't make that issue up, but they're exploiting it. And they're trying to drive a wedge into American society uh, by reminding people of it. Uh, These are more examples from Black this. Um, they ultimately uh, stopped operating after the first uh, anniversary of Freddie Gray's death uh, because they um, tried to organize a march in Baltimore uh, on the one year anniversary of. Remember, Baltimore had riots after Freddie Gray died, right? So they're trying to organize a march, hoping more violence is going to ensue. Um, and the family of Freddie Gray sent a message to these folks and said, Who are you? We don't know who you are. Stay out of our town. And that was pretty much the last we saw of blacktivists. A bunch of ads that were purchased by the Russian Internet Research Agency in 2016. One of the tells here is that they bought them in rubles. But let's leave that aside for now, Facebook. Um, they would often go after uh, communities that uh, uh, oftentimes it might look like they were, uh, they were uh, trying to be, come out in favor of gay rights. But really what they're trying to do is they're trying to trigger people who are going to have a violent reaction to gay rights. So this is an ad uh, targeting the LGBT community that says God hates bigots, and it's about the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, when I was working in the center, I had the solemn privilege of going to a number of uh, uh, funerals for American soldiers, and they're about the most odorous bunch of people that you can imagine. But the fact that the Russians are uh, uh, organizing counter-protests against the Westboro Baptist Church, these are the folks who would show up at soldiers' funerals and say that they died because America is uh, too generous in, 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 our, in our policy around gay rights. All right, so Westboro Baptist Church, not good people, Russians amplifying it. Um, they did others where they were uh, um, celebrating sort of Texas independence uh, and trying to draw attention to issues on America's border, particularly around immigration. Um, they had two different campaigns running. Uh, one was, hey, if Hillary Clinton wins, Texas get ready to secede, right? Because Texas nationalism is a real thing. Um, they paid 2,300 rubles for this ad. Um, and what's really interesting is that when the election was over, the effort didn't stop. In fact, USA Today did a, uh, a, an analysis in February of 2017 that showed that actually racially divisive posts by the Internet Research Agency went up after Election Day, trying to amplify the divisiveness that was already resident in American politics. Um, they also, uh, this is more reporting on that, it's after the election. So some of the more recent stuff that we saw, uh, again, stuff that seems to be celebrating a positive but is really intending to trigger somebody, started with undoc undocumented mom and dad, now I'm a college grad, my parents crossed the border so I could cross the stage. Again, they're trying to trigger people who would be offended by undocumented immigrants or illegal immigration. A Muslim police officer in a hijab, that would be offensive to some people. Uh, more about immigration, that was a big one. And then this one, you've got Hillary Clinton with someone in a hijab. I'm like, but this is two months after the election. Why? She lost. It's over, right? But there we are. Um, the, all of these seem, again, to they, they straddle this issue where they seem to be supporting one thing, but they're really just trying to stoke a divisive issue in American society. This is the part in the talk where everybody says, Are you guys for real? Is this, is this stuff real? And um, I go back to this, uh, this, uh, this, this article. Uh, the MIT Technology Review from 2014. Bono's on the cover. How can I ever go wrong with Bono? Big data will save politics, right? Big data is, is uh, uh, statistics, right? It's, it's the, about individual behaviors captured in numbers, and then how can you interpret what those things mean? What we didn't know at that time was that, uh, that uh, in uh, early 2013, Facebook, working with researchers at Cornell University, ran an unwitting experiment on 700,000 of their users, trying to determine if emotional contagion could be spread through Facebook. Now, emotional contagion is a well-documented, well-understood psychological phenomena. It's your Aunt Shirley. Every time she walks in the room, she brings the whole place down. She makes everybody a little bit crazy and everybody gets a little bit amped up. That's emotional contagion. And it works on social media. And Facebook knows it. And Facebook added... Remember back in the day, the only thing you could do on Facebook was give something a thumbs up. Now you can like it, you can love it, you can make you cry, it can make you laugh. Those are the fifth thing, the five things you can do now. Because what they did was they increased the specificity of you saying, 
yes, I'm emotionally responsive to this post. And from that, they're able to create psychographic profiles to micro-target you. So the way you buy soap, the way you buy cars, right? This is an established technique in advertising. Social media is effectively turned into precision guided munitions of the mind. You can buy ads targeting specific people and craft messages that will be specifically tailored to one individual's psychographic profile. This is wild stuff. All right, so what did the Russians really do with this? Well, this is a great question. Did they change votes? No. Did they change minds? Well, maybe. That's the question. Uh, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, more names than I'm gonna read right now, these group of scholars, went back and looked at what we know about when did the internet research agency launch a specific social media campaign and what happened in the polling data immediately after that. And what they found, highlighted down here in yellow, is that for approximately every 25,000 retweets of a specific IRA campaign, Donald Trump would gain one percentage point in the polls. 25,000 retweets, a 1% gain for Donald Trump. In other words, forensically, researchers have gone back and begun to understand that there was a scale. There was a scale that the Russians, because they were doing this longer and knew that they were doing it, would have been able to figure it out on their own. Just from publicly available polling data. We do this, that happens. We do that, that happens. 25,000 retweets, one percentage point gain. So the question then we find ourselves asking, and we will never know the answer to, is whether or not you could put your finger on the scale just enough in a couple of key states to change enough votes in people's minds to alter the outcome of the 2016 election. Now, thing is, they weren't just doing this uh, to, to change votes in the United States. They are also doing this to undermine America's confidence in our electoral integrity, okay? So, uh, we know, we know, we know, and this is from the bipartisan Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, five volume study, thousands of pages. Russia targeted election systems in all 50 states, all 50 states. In some of those states, they went in, they got in, they looked around and they came out. In a couple of states, they got to the part of the Secretary of State's website where you would uh, 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 manage uh, voter registrations. And it's almost like they kept their mouth, their hand on the mouse long enough for the cybersecurity people back in various state capitals to see that, that and say, whoa, what's that? And then they leave. They didn't change anything. <coughs> they didn't change any registrations. They could have, but they didn't. They just got in mucked around a little bit, got back out. This is what active measures looks like today because at the same time that they're mucking around in those 50 state registration systems, this company, the Tennessee GOP, which was not the Tennessee GOP, it was a troll account operated out of the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia, but in their description described themselves as the unofficial account of the Tennessee Republican Party, tweeted this. Thousands of names changed on voter rolls in Indiana. Police investigating with a very stern-faced Mike Pence, right? So in other words, at the very moment that their intelligence service is mucking around in voter databases in a position to change names on voter rolls, they're tweeting about it. So, excuse me. What we're left to conclude is that the Russians were interested mostly and sowing chaos and distrust in America's electoral system. It's a long trend, a long standing trend in Western Europe. The further you were born away from the end of World War II, the least likely you are to believe that democracy is something worth saving. It's a whole nother conversation for another night. But the Soviets, the Russians now, excuse me, have been supporting these kind of divisive politics all over the West. So uh, the National Front in France. Uh, has had substantial financial ties with Russia, uh, as long as Marine Le Pen has been its leader. Uh, Syriza in Greece, again, uh, has ties to Russian financing. Um, Five-star movement in Italy uh, is uh, receiving tremendous financial support from the Russians. Uh, so is Fidesz in Hungary. 
Viktor Orban is a very close partner and ally of uh, Vladimir Putin. And the Freedom Party in Austria signed a deal uh, to have a partnership with Russia in terms of messaging. So these ties are deep and extensive, and they haven't gone away. So this reporting is from earlier this year, but it, basically it says Russia's backs Europe's far right. Emails and documents show just how close the Italian, French, German, and Austrian officials coordinate with Moscow. This is an ongoing campaign. This is an ongoing campaign by the Russians, an ongoing threat to Western unity. The other thing that they use is uh, dupes. I think that might be the right word, or, or individuals in, in countries who will break the law of their of, of that of their target country to be an unregistered agent of Russia in the in the American parliament. This is just uh, this uh, this story was July 29th, so uh, late last week, right? Um, where a Russian national was charged with spreading propaganda through the United States uh, with finance and messaging that was being coordinated with uh, organizations here in the United States. So other examples of things Russia has done since 2014, they ran campaigns in the Scottish independence vote in both uh, Brexit votes, uh, the French elections of 2017 and 2022, the German election of 2017, the Catalonia independence movement in Spain and their vote in 2017, U.S. elections, just keep adding to that one. And then the, Canada, the Canadian vote in 2021. All right, so these are documented. We can see the evidence. It's all out there on social media. Uh, we can see it. Um, now, I want to I catch us up to the day. I'm going to slide through a bunch of slides here, just in the interest of time. Um, but basically, it, they're not done with social media. They're also from, uh, forging ties with American extremist movements. Uh, particularly far-right extremist movement. So the Unite the Right people uh, spent a lot of that time in Charlottesville chanting, Russia is our friend. We don't, I'm not going to try to unpack that. Um, so uh, I mentioned the Texas secession movement. There was also a California secession movement that actually had a ballot initiative, or at least they tried to get a ballot initiative going. Uh, it was called Yes, California. And the really interesting thing about that is the guy who uh, organized it, Louis Marinelli, started the petition uh, for that ballot initiative in California from his home in Moscow. Okay, so um, yeah, you get the idea. So uh, I'm gonna skip through this stuff because what I wanna get to is uh, coronavirus. So we've been dealing with this since uh, early 2020, right? Uh, and the truth is this isn't Russia's first effort to stoke fears about public health in the United States or anywhere else for that matter. So uh, there's a long list of man-made diseases. I'm using air quotes because that was essentially the Russian refrain. Coronavirus is man-made disease. It created an American military lab or CIA lab. Uh, bio labs, something we've heard a lot about at the start of the Ukraine war. The last time I heard about bio labs, they were blaming coronavirus being engineered in uh, American bio labs in Eastern Europe. The classic example of this comes from the 1980s when, again, Soviet intelligence officers went into an uh, Indian newspaper uh, in, in, in South Asia, India, uh, in the Indian newspaper and planted a story. Uh, this is a newspaper that the KGB controlled, English language newspaper, planted a story that the HIV virus that had been recently discovered responsible for uh, AIDS was actually engineered in an American military weapons lab. And then that story uh, sort of percolated a little bit, popped up in this story in a newspaper here and a newspaper there. Over the next five years, it ultimately was uh, published in 80 newspapers around the world, translated into 30 different languages. Uh, and it was all a lie, all just made up. But it was intended to try to undermine America's confidence in, particularly African-Americans' confidence in, the, in, in their government's response to the AIDS crisis crisis and also undermine America's position in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so the other examples, H1N1, Ebola, on Ebola, they were doing the same thing. Um, you know, so basically this is an early internet research agency tweet. Uh, Ebola is government made and the terrorist threat is too. Yeah, so, okay. Um, but that was what they were trying to do. Uh, they also, they would tweet what looked like uh, screen grabs from uh, established websites for like, this is Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta met new Ebola case and basically says that the white physicians at Atlanta hospitals won't treat black patients. That's basically what they were trying to say. A couple of different examples of that. Atlanta doctors, they cure uh, Ebola infected black women. Really subtle stuff that they're doing here. 
but this is what they were tweeting in the middle of the Ebola scare. Um, 2015, uh, 2015, the Russians got into the anti-vax business. Uh, they started tweeting uh, uh, information uh, questioning the health uh, effects and results of um, normal childhood vaccines. Uh, one of the interesting things here is that this guy here, Tanner's dad, Tim, that's a real American. One of the innovations in 2015 is that they stopped creating their own accounts. They just found those divisive American forces and amplified it through their own networks. So this is a guy who doesn't believe that his, his, his son should be vaccinated. Uh, and, and he's tweeting it, but the Russians are amplifying. Um, the American Journal of Public Health actually did a study on this uh, and found that uh, Twitter bots and Russian trolls were amplifying both sides, not pro-vax, anti-vax, both sides of the vaccine debate. Because the Russians, remember, don't really care one way or the other. They just want us to kill each other in the process. And that's what's going on here. And more data about the different messages that they were, that they were tweeting. Um, and so that brings us to um, uh, coronavirus. And all of those same refrains were, were meted out pretty effectively throughout 2020 uh, as the West sort of churned on whether or not, well, is it real? Do we have to really be worried about it? Do we need a mask? Don't we have to mask? What good is a mask? Oh, what about vaccines? And you see this play out. Um, some of these things were actually led to violence. This is actually a, an image from uh, Ukraine, where a group of uh, Ukrainian students were traveling back to Ukraine from China. And when uh, the Russians uh, sent an email to a couple of hundred thousand uh, people in Ukraine saying, hey, these people are coming back and they've got the virus. They tried to barricade the streets and try to stop these people from getting back to their homes just because they were traveling back from China at the start of the, at the, start of the pandemic. Russian television specifically linked coronavirus to US laboratories. So um, I mentioned this already, but basically they uh, identified American, uh, after the Cold War, the United States helped uh, uh, shut down the biological and chemical weapons programs in the former Soviet Union. And we spent a lot of money doing that and the world is better off for that. Um, but the Russians would have you believe that in that very lab, we engineered coronavirus uh, in an effort to try to curtail, they said initially China. Um, but what's interesting is that the places where they were most active on the coronavirus disinformation were Lithuania, which is uh, a former Soviet Republic, Ukraine, a former Soviet Republic, and Georgia, a former Soviet Republic. I would also note that in the case of Georgia and Ukraine, they also are fighting a war either against Russian separatists or the Russians themselves at this point. Only Lithuania, who's a member of NATO, has been spared that so far. Um, the typical hobgoblins of this story from the Russians today are Bill Gates, uh, George Soros, and the CIA. Some sort of global cabal involving those three players is responsible for just about everything bad in the world, uh, according to the Russians. These are their usual suspects, if you will. But one of the disinformation campaigns that they launched was to specifically undermine public confidence in the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and so they amplified other, they amplified questions and concerns that people had raised uh, about the effectiveness and about the safety of these vaccines. Uh, this was also an effort in the, in the rest of the world to undermine the competitiveness of the Pfizer vaccine with the Russians' own Sputnik V vaccine that they had produced. So there's some commercial competition to it too. But this is Russia today, the, 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 the state broadcaster in Russia. Um, you know, uh, critics accuse Bill Gates of using third world countries as lab rats. Again, Bill Gates is the boogeyman. Big Pharma opposes justice warriors while reserving COVID jabs for the rich. So again, reinforcing those divisions in American society between rich and poor. Um, I watched the below vid. Uh, this one uh, links um, 5G technology and the coronavirus vaccines and we're all magnets. And we're gonna, I don't know what that. Um, uh, and so you, you get the idea. They, they sort of plan on all of these things. My favorite, though, I have to say, and this was particularly prevalent in Latin America, was that um, the uh, vaccines that the West, and particularly the United States, was trying to sell to the developing world uh, would turn you into a monkey. And they called it a monkey vaccine. You're going to hear it first tonight. It's a matter of time before monkeypox is somehow roped into this. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm not joking about that. It's just a matter of time. Um, again, the selective editing of information is a big part of it. Um, seven die at Spanish care home after getting the Pfizer COVID-19 jab. 
as all residents test positive for the virus, second dose is still to come. What they didn't indicate was that everybody who died was well over the age of 95. Uh, and it wasn't the vaccine that killed them. It was often a number of other end of life illnesses that they had before they got the vaccine. Uh, the, the healthcare workers are just trying to keep them alive. All right, so I will give you one last little bit and then I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. This is the question that I always get. So how can I spot Russian disinformation. Because the truth of the matter is that right now in this day and age where we all have got phones and computers and tablets, we are as much purveyors of information as we are consumers of information. And every time we retweet or like or share something, we are spreading it through our own information ecosystems. So we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility as individual users and consumers of information not to spread the toxic stuff. So I'll give you a couple of quick talking points and then I'll be happy to answer some questions. So when I teach, uh, I tell my students that look, assessing the validity of a source is not that hard. You gotta use some common sense. Ask yourself three questions. Is the argument valid? Is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is there anything that actually supports the idea that a vaccine is gonna turn you into a monkey? And don't stay watch, watch the YouTube video. Is there anything that would validly, based on everything you've ever known about science, that a vaccine would turn you into a monkey? The answer is no. Well, that's one big strike against it. Who's the intended audience? Can you tell by whatever the message is that there is a, uh, that, 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 that they're particularly targeting an audience, right? Whether it is a underrepresented population or an out group, or are they trying to target people who might feel like they are somehow aggrieved, right? All of those things are a little bit of a red flag. That seems too tailored, like maybe they're trying to engineer a specific response. And finally, who's the author? And is their argument authoritative? Just don't share it. Let it end with you. You can make that decision at, 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 in, in your own time uh, and at your own pace uh, because you ultimately are the one who's about to hit like or share or retweet. So more on this. Uh, so um, six in 10 of you will share this link without reading it, a new depressing study says, right? Um, and I think we've all done it. Uh, and so one of the simplest things we can do is actually read the stuff that we're putting out there uh, so that we're not contributing to the toxicity of American politics. So with that, I'm gonna turn it open to questions. Um, and I'd be happy to answer as many as I possibly can. And if you want to talk about uh, Ukraine, um, oh yeah, this is the punchline, right? What Russia would like to see happen is that uh, the, the European Union will fall apart. I also believe a maximalist outcome for the United States, for, for Russia and the United States is that the American Union collapses. Um, and you can interpret that in a lot of different ways, but basically the end of the, of the federal republic as we know it um, is I think what, uh, Vladimir Putin would consider poetic justice since he blames the United States for the demise of the Soviet Union, an event he calls the greatest geostrategic disaster of the 20th century. So on that cheery note, uh, I'd be happy to take any sort of questions. Right. I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the question is how, yeah, the question is how do we change um, Russian behavior and American behavior so that instead of constantly fighting, uh, we're able to get along? Um, this is the eternal question, right? Uh, which is how, why do uh, 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 
nations oppose each other? Why do they, why do they uh, seek confrontation sometimes, it seems? Um, you know, I am a believer in uh, the idea that states are, that, that leaders of states are rational actors. That on some level, uh, leaders in both Washington and Moscow have made a conclusion that it's in their nation's best interest to pursue these courses, right? Now, I can sit back, though, and I could also say, you know, um, I would have a different perspective on this, I'm sure, if I was a citizen of Ukraine uh, or a citizen of Georgia or, uh, or uh, Azerbaijan, right? There are enough places in Russia's near abroad that have faced direct Russian aggression in the last 20 years, that I am left to conclude that Russia is a revanchist state in the classic sense of that term, that's seeking to alter the existing international order and will you know, uh, undermine any adversary and they think of us as an adversary. And so the choice then the United States has, we're gonna say, well, we don't really care about Ukraine, that's not important to us. We don't care about Georgia, we don't care about anybody else for that matter we'll just sort of take care of our own and that's enough. I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. Other people will be, other people may be. That's ultimately what elections are about, right? And, and we'll, we'll have that debate, I'm sure, as part of the 2024 campaign cycle about what's America's role in the world and our relationship with, whether it's uh, Russia or China or Iran or whoever. And I should mention, I focused on Russia tonight. China's using this stuff too. They have a slightly different MO and a slightly different approach to these, these technologies, but they're doing this too. So are the Iranians, so are the Vietnamese. Um, you could argue that some of our, our, our friendly partners in Europe are maybe not being as manipulative as some of these techniques are, but uh, you know, using information as a, as a means of influence is, uh, is not uh, the, the sole domain and reserve of, of adversaries. Yeah. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, so the question is whether or not the Russians have been active in uh, sort of sowing uh, the narrative that the American constitution is flawed and inefficient and our, our government is unresponsive. Um, I'm not familiar with, I don't want to rule anything out, but I'm not familiar with that off the top of my head. Um, most of the stuff that I've seen really has been focused on really divisive issues around identity. So LGBTQ rights, uh, immigration, uh, 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 race relations in the United States. Um, that's sort of their, that's their sweet spot. Yes, yes sir. In that space, yeah. So the question is, is the, does the, is the United States using information uh, and even disinformation uh, around the world? So on information, uh, yes. The answer is uh, uh, unqualified yes. The United States used to be a lot better at it than we are right now. Uh, in the Eisenhower administration, which is what actually what I wrote my dissertation about, they created the U.S. Information Agency specifically to tell the world this America story and to make sure that independent news had an audience all over the world. Um, and throughout most of the Cold War, um, we had organizations like Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty in Europe, uh, radio uh, in the Americas. Uh, we had Radio Marty broadcasting to Cuba. We had all of these U.S. government broadcasting outlets that in the age before Twitter and the age before um, social media was really about getting information into closed societies. And it, the, the idea then was that, well, okay, it's a closed society. If we get information and freedom will flourish. Now, the challenge is that even authoritarian societies are a little bit more porous than they were in the bad old days of the Cold War, with some notable exceptions. China has an internet kill switch. Russia has an internet kill switch. You can't get Facebook and Twitter in China. They've got their own Chinese alternatives that are controlled by Chinese government, not in the slide deck, but when uh, Barack Obama went and visited uh, President Xi, uh, the, a meme popped up. Uh, and so meme is a, 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 an image that conveys a story, right? So a meme pops up that shows Xi and 
uh, Obama walking through a garden and next to it is a picture of uh, Tigger and Winnie the Pooh. And the Chinese censors hated it. And they swept that off the Chinese internet in the course of an afternoon because it seemed to demean and, 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 and undermine the authority of President Xi. Authoritarian governments care a lot more about what's in their information networks than we do in the West. And so what we, the challenge for the West remains really, how do you get your message into those closed uh, news, uh, closed, uh, news environments? Uh, and we're not open source as much as I know, because I don't have a security clearance anymore. I don't know what's going on at really classified levels. But from what we're able to see, it's not nearly as sophisticated as it once was. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, if you're a skeptic and you heard my presentation tonight, you could simply accuse me of being the purveyor of disinformation. Uh, and there is a sizable percentage of Americans who would believe that about me, uh, which is why I made all of my biases known up front. Um, the, the, but the question is, how do we get back to a shared, um, a shared understanding of, you know, it's basically an agreed upon fact pattern if you're a lawyer, right? Uh, and um, this is a really hard issue, and I don't have a good answer for it. The period in the Cold War where we talked about this, most Americans got their news from one of three major networks, ABC, CBS, or NBC, whether it was radio or television, right? And you had very sort of, uh, you had a monoculture, right? There was one culture that everybody could tap into. Uh, and so the stories made sense because all of our cultural references were self-referential, and we all knew them. I'm afraid that year is gone. Uh, and so, uh, independent from this work that we do on disinformation at the Pell Center, we're actually trying to develop a new initiative to imagine what's the story that unifies Americans in the face of this kind of threat, in the, in the face of a whole bunch of other threats that are tr really trying to rip America apart. What's the story that we tell ourselves as a society that's going to unify us in the 21st century? We think, although we haven't finished our work on this yet, we think that it's grounded in the ideals and the Declaration of Independence. And I'm mindful of the fact that 2026 will be the 250th year uh, of uh, 250th anniversary of the Declaration. And maybe there's something around that, um, but it's hard. It's hard because there's, we are, you know, we all compete um, for a limited amount of time and attention uh, on all of the different platforms that we might have in front of us. When I was a kid growing up, if it was Thursday night, you were watching Happy Days. Right. And then when Happy Days was done, you were watching Cosby. Right. That kind of experience doesn't exist anymore. And so um, the challenge that we have, I think, is a political challenge. And we need leaders who care as much about bringing Americans together as we do have leaders on all sides who are interested in driving people apart because that's going to turn out their their bases uh, turn out on Election Day. I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. So, so the, just for the people who are out, outside, the you know the question is, um, how do we um, address this this divisiveness that's inherent in American society as a way to sort of try to counteract this? Um, and and so one of the things I would say I mentioned to you what we can all do is we think about what we're sharing on social media. 
But really what we're talking about fundamentally is a rebirth of critical thinking. Right? Like this is, this is, I'm a humanities guy, right? This is what my whole education was based on, right? We need to have, we need to have a rebirth of critical thinking in this United, in the United States, uh, because the, regardless of whether or not someone's trying to topple America, we get sold a bill of goods on a daily basis. And if you just sort of accept everything at face value, um, you know, uh, what was the old line that, uh, you know, fool's born every minute. Um, we need to be able to look at evidence, make some informed judgments. And also the other thing that I really think is super critical in all of this is that we have to individually uh, take the venom out of American politics. We can't see the people who disagree with us politically as less American, less intelligent, less motivated to do good, right? We've got to remember that at the end of the day, this little experiment with Republican government is based on we the people and we're in this together and that's something that you know that and critical thinking i think is really the secret sauce for for, for ultimately prevailing thank you all very much I don't think we can top Jim's concluding statement, so I'm not going to. Please stay, enjoy some drink if you'd like, uh, visit with Jim some more. Thank you for coming. <laughs>